Hello, I'm Andre J, and welcome to this month's edition, February's edition of my Patreon wage labor video. Um, this video is uh, has been commissioned by the folks who follow my Patreon. I've got a new thing going on where every month people can vote on a topic and then suggest some sort of thing within that topic that I will do a video on. Um, so if you like videos like this, um, and the videos, the many sort of educational edutainment videos I've done in the past, uh, just keep in mind that's the only way things like that are going to happen in the future for the immediate future is that it's, it's got to come through the Patreon, uh, because I'm just simply not in a place where I have the time and resources, uh, to devote to doing this kind of work without some sort of like uh, 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 both sign from people that this is something they actually really want to have and a sign that they're willing to pay for it. So uh, uh, crowdsourcing the funds for this kind of thing is how it's moving forward, but I'm still going to make them available for everyone. Um, so I'm not going to pay all these videos, but if you want to have a say in what kind of videos I'm making, uh, 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 then definitely hop over to the Patreon. And you do have to be a member of the Patreon for a while to suggest things. I'm not, there's no hit and runs here. I'm not supporting hit and runs. The whole point of the Patreon is you keep supporting it for a tiny bit regularly, not put $5 in, demand things, and then dip forever. Um, that, so that's that's sort of the, 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 um, <clears throat> the, 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 the background there. And the other cool thing about the Patreon wage labor is that the money coming in for Patreon isn't very much at the moment, um, and I'm giving myself an hourly rate and calculating how many hours I'm going to work based on that. Uh, if the money coming into Patreon is a larger amount, and it gets to the point where I can start saying, "Oh, I've got a week's worth of work here that I can that I that I'm getting paid decently to do," then we can make that something where I'm working on updates to the desktop video waves, updates to vSerpy. Um, updates to gravity waves, like larger code projects and stuff like that are, are, are totally plausible if there's more money coming into the Patreon. So, and I'm seeing numbers go up since I started doing this, so I think that this is totally an achievable thing probably by like this time next year. Patreon will probably be in a good spot where you can like pay me to like re do requested changes and alternate images and stuff like that for the, the, the video synthesizers I designed. So, um, cool stuff. Good thing to, it, it would be a good thing for those who are interested in that kind of shit to get in on the, on that sooner than later, because like I said, I'm, I'm only letting people, you only get to vote and just, you only really get to decide and suggest things if you've been a member of the Patreon for a certain amount of time. So get in there sooner if you want to have a voice and just know that hit and runs don't count. So, <clears throat> all right. So, but yeah, for, for probably most of this year, it's just going to be like one-off YouTube videos like this that are like an hour or two hours long, um, and the subject matter will be decided on uh, in a bit of a, a back and forth between me and the folks on the Patreon. So for this one, uh, the, 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 the topic that was voted for was general video art stuff. And the, the, I only got one suggestion from what would be within the general video art stuff, so I'm just going to read that right here. Um, the request was for a video that would be on, and now I'm quoting, general video art technique, techniques and VJ practices, parentheses, setup, loadout for live shows, studio, recording, editing tips, uh, and even some highlights on analog and digital video art history and or influential figures in the craft would all be cool topics to see covered. Um, so yeah, I'm going to touch on some stuff from all of that. I'm going to do this in two parts. Um, the first part, I'll cover up the, the VJ practices stuff. Um, and in the second part, I'll talk about one specific influential figure that I don't think anyone has really been talking about, but they're actually probably very seminal to many modern video artists, like uh, idea of what is video art. <coughs> so pretty cool stuff. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so part one, we're gonna talk about general video art techniques. And then just, just to like sort of throw on a side here, when folks do the suggestions, pl please definitely try to be as specific as possible. Cause it's, I mean, if you just say make a gravity waves video and then it's just up to me to figure out what to do in that gravity waves video, like I'm just gonna fuck around. Um, Cause I'm not gonna like 
put that amount, I can't really put that amount of work into actually like creating a timeline and a script and like a sequence of things to do uh, because that's also labor. So the, the amount of time that it goes into it, like, like with it, it, it's, it's all work. That's the thing is like, I'm really trying to hammer down on like any sort of like public speaking or like public presenting thing right now is just like a lot of the work I've done has been kind of like occluded and being paid for by the fact that like sales were doing really well and I had like a space in Brooklyn where I was able to like do classes often enough that I just had like plenty of not plenty of I had a significantly decent amount of spare time and a significantly decent amount of spare cash to be able to like throw my energy and throw like money at like doing sort of more public uh edutainment kind of events and videos and shit like that and that's all kind of dried up it's not really happening anymore so i just really want to like hammer down that like i can't keep the same pace that i was going at before because i don't have the money and the resources for it it's all labor all this shit is labor and no one really like so many people just don't think that like oh putting together like a video that's not really labor you're just like talking to a camera there's no work in that um but i mean there's tons of fucking work in this like I mean, even though I'm not, like, doing, like, tons of editing or, like, putting in, like, a lot of those, like, you know, like, every other YouTuber has, like, um, stupid, like, uh, uh, cuts all the time. Like, I, I do this as off the cuff as possible, live. I don't really edit other than maybe if there's two or three parts, I'll just glue them together. Um, <clears throat> but, like, thinking about preparing what you're going to talk about and preparing information if you need to do any sort of research and preparation of clips or anything like that it's all a lot of work um so i just want to be perfectly clear the more explicit y'alls are when you request things the better and this was a pretty great uh explicit request so all right but yeah it's like you know like for most youtubers like what do you do once you like actually need to make money on it you get like people get like sponsorships of some kind and you just end up like hawking other people's stuff but, like, this is video art stuff. Like, I, you know, I'm 100% not going to get, like, fucking Roland Ederall to, like, send me gear and pay me to review it. Because, like, why the fuck would they care what I think? They're selling things to streamers, not to, like, uh, esoteric YouTubers. Um, and I'm not going to, like, what, call up Big Popper and be like, hey, yo, fucking throw me some bones and like give me the, the 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 televangelist and i'll do like a whole bunch of like sponsored bullshit things for it like no that's not happening like it's all either y'all's pay for it and y'all's like help me decide what to do or it just doesn't happen anymore all right so vj practices let's talk about vj practices uh doing live visuals for other bands so uh full disclosure i'm an awful person to ask about vj practices because the way i got into doing live visuals was i did live audio visual performance uh, and this was starting in um early 2010s i guess the teens early teens was when i started doing live av stuff and i come mainly from like a world of live performing music like like i've been a, a live performing musician for um the overwhelming majority of my life i started playing in bands and performing in bands and recording stuff when i was like 14 and i'm 42 ish right now so that's an overwhelming uh, part of my life where that's been something that's been like a major and regular thing that i've done so I come at the whole world of performing anything the same way I sort of like got in the habit of doing so when I was young, which was just pretty much just like, it was punk to the point of just like, whatever it takes to get things done, just get fucking things done. Like, don't wait for anyone else, like the DIY aesthetic of just like, don't wait for someone else to make a show happen. Don't wait for someone else to record your band. Don't wait for someone else to like put out an album. Just do all this shit yourself, and maybe at a certain point someone else will help you with that, but don't rely on anyone else. Um, so that kind of like is where I'm coming from when I started doing live visuals. Um, and when I did live visuals, like, I had no idea about... The only video art tools I knew of was that I know that people had, like, 
There were some people who had like modified like video game consoles uh, uh, that they used for doing weird glitchy live visuals. And I knew that some people had modified like analog video processors that they were using to do like live stuff. I think I knew about that through like, um, like I had friends who did like, uh, uh the wrong, they did a, like, um, I had like some net art friends who were doing like, uh, pavilions, digital pavilions for the wrong. So I found out a bunch, a lot of glitch art stuff from that. Uh, I was living in Chicago at the time. So like you would go out, I would go out to like parties. It was right after the end of the sort of like glitch art noise scene, kind of like, um, scattered to the winds in Chicago because there was like that big like festival thing they had that like stopped the year I moved there but I would go to parties where a lot of those folks were at and people would do various sorts of like performance art things that were like loosely had like vi audio and visual components um so I was coming from that I didn't really know anything about um I don't really know if LZX really fully existed at the time or if it was just kind of like just getting started um, I didn't really know about VPMC or, and they're just like, I knew about Tachyons, of course, that was like the first one I kind of found out about that like most of the folks in the glitch art world sort of like knew about, knew about Logan's thing. Um, but otherwise, like all I knew of really personally that I knew to do was like programming and making my own controllable video instruments that I could use for in a live setting. So that's pretty much what I was doing. My rig for the longest time was literally just like a PC tower that I took apart, put into just like a tiny little like Panasonic camera um, suitcase. So it would just be like, and I'd just basically take it apart and I'd just like put it back together, just like plug in power supply, plug in a graphics card. Um, and have like one thing go out to projectors, one thing go out to CRTs if there were CRTs around, because I would have graphics cards that have like both digital and analog video outputs. Um, and then I would have these uh, uh, programs I wrote in processing for doing live live video stuff. And I would do that along with performing music. So so my thing was never never to be like I'm doing live visuals for another musician. And honestly, I think that's kind of fucking annoying and lame for me to do. I don't like to do that. I've only done it a handful of times and I've always found it to be like a real shit job. Um, uh, 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 so like, I was always just like, I would do visuals for other musicians if we practiced music and visuals together. That was the one sort of like trade-off thing where it'd be like, if we are like, practicing and making this our band thing together like that's a completely different thing um but just like being like hired as a gig to do visuals for like some random bands like uh yeah i mean i've done like session musician things and even with session musician things you fucking practice with the band beforehand uh and they usually pay you <laughs> reasonably to do that uh if it's even it's if it's for live or for like a recording like <clears throat> It's, it's not like the way that I've seen sort of like live visuals work out. Um, so yeah, I would just have that kind of a setup. Um, and then as I started learning a bit more about the analog side of things and finding cool analog video gear around, I would work in camera feedback. I would work in TV walls. Um, I would work in, so I'd, so I'd take like the digital stuff I was working with on my computer and then run it through analog stuff, use the, the graphics as like seeds for camera feedback and stuff like that. Uh, and that's how I worked for a pretty long time. Um, so yeah, in terms of like, so, so in terms of like set up and load up for live shows, like. I mean, honestly, the main thing I can think of is just, like, keep it light and keep it simple. Like, like for real, um, you're, you're probably not getting paid that much, and you probably don't really have that much time to do the stuff. So what I've seen is the best kind of thing to do is learn how to build your own cases for things, and don't always don't even necessarily always rely on the, 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 the case that someone provides for your gear. If you can... Build it out, build it into a case, set it up with something more minimal and simple that only has the controls that you actually need to use to perform. 
uh, then you might be able to like have like a medium sized wooden case that you could put some wheels on and shit and like have that you could just whip it up. All you have to do is plug your power into something else and you have a video out that you plug somewhere else. Everything else is all set up to go. And if that's what I would end up doing, if I was seriously gigging like a touring, like regular, like video artist person, I wouldn't really be fucking around with like plugging in like 10 different cables and like figuring out the best spot on the table to put everything in this very specific location. Just have it all in a case, have like monitors for you to look at in this case, build out your case to the specs of what you need uh and like look at like how people do like pedal boards in like the 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 the, the my bloody valentine style bands like look at that and see how people build that shit out and go from there um so that would be like the one advice there for studio recording editing stuff studio stuff <clears throat> The important thing about having like a studio setup where you can just like press, for me it's about being able to just press a button and record uh, what you're doing at any time. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily have to be like the highest quality recording, but it should be a good enough recording that if this is the only thing you get of this session, you'd be happy with it. Um, practically speaking, what I usually use for like good enough, but like not the best would be like uh, 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 if I'm working with an analog signal, I'll use a hardware upscaler of some kind, go into HDMI, and then use the HDMI on a black magic capture box to go into 10-bit uncompressed video. So that's pretty good. That's like the, 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 the highest mediocre quality I'll go for for a capture. If I'm really serious about like giving a shit about having a good capture, I use a nice Trinitron computer monitor. I use another upscaler that goes from analog composite into like analog um, XGA, which is the extended VGA world, <clears throat> and use like a really nice Trinitron computer monitor to rescan at like 1080 or 4K. And that's that's like the 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 last couple of like big sort of video projects I've done. That would be Ultra Terrestrial and Tantric Acid. We're both rescanned like that. Ultra Terrestrial was rescanned all at um, 1080, um, I think 1080 60, and then um, Tantric Acid was rescanned at 4K um, 4K 30, uh, both using like a Panasonic. So, but the the problem with having a setup like that is you do kind of have to tweak it a little bit. It's pretty hard unless you've got a giant studio and you've got something really nice built out with like a hood. You've got really good light controls and like nothing's really going to be moving around. Um, and you do have to fucking move your camera around to put the battery back in. So it's always just a little bit more work to do the rescans. But when I'm serious about like I want like I really want to have like a super high resolution, high quality control over the color to like a fine point um, capture, I use the rescanning thing. Otherwise, having something pretty simple where it's like just a matter of like what I do now is just have it like mostly just be a matter of like 60 seconds or less for me to like whip out a, a capture card, plug it in. Uh, oftentimes I'll just have a separate laptop that I don't use for anything else than just capturing for like a, a fixed amount of time and make sure it's got like at least like a terabyte full so I could just like load it up with the uncompressed 10 bit video. Um, so yeah, those are the kind of tips for that. Um, I guess like other kind of tips I have for VJ artists in general is that like, so like I personally have very rarely done the kind of like show up, do visuals. I would do show up and do visuals for parties more often for them for shows. So I was mostly working with like DJs and stuff. And like, I mean, like I've been to like my fair amount of like really mediocre house music in my life. So like, it's not the worst thing in the world. I would say for me, it's better to like do like set up like a visual installation kind of thing for a party where people are just going to be like bump into like mediocre house music. Like well, this was like 10 years ago or something. So it's probably not mediocre house music anymore. I don't know. I don't know what like the, 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 the 18 to 25 demographic is doing right now for dance. It, could very easily still be mediocre house music. 
I would say that kind of gig, if I'm getting paid to just do visual stuff for that, setting up more like a fuck ton of TVs and installation and some sort of like interactive portion where there's a video camera pointing out and people able to see themselves on the CRTs, see themselves on the projections, see themselves on the big screens. Like that's, that's at least like a bit more fun than like doing the setup where there's like a bunch of fucking like rock and roll bands or some sort of musician, like serious musicians who are like very much like I'm getting credit for the things I'm doing here and you need to just shut the fuck up and like do what I'm telling you kind of deal. Um, I like that kind of deal a little bit better, but I have definitely done gotten paid to like help out other video artists uh vjs do like various vj things uh in various locations and what i will say about that whole realm of doing visuals for bands um as opposed to doing visuals for like parties art openings or like um raves and shit like that is that like you also get treated like shit um and you really shouldn't put up with it anymore um <laughs> like seriously like the kind of bullshit that people put on like visual artists and vjs for like the sort of like i i don't even know what you call it anymore noise rock synthesizer producer shit like whatever anything where you have a show where like all the musicians probably at least hopefully want to be on some kind of a label they're all self-promoting as opposed to like DJ shows, like, the DJs don't really promote themselves the same way that, like, I don't know, some sort of, like, independent recording artist does. It's a totally different ego trip. Not saying DJs don't have, like, different kind of, like, ego, not their own kind of ego trips, but it's completely different from, like, the I'm a band, yo, uh, sort of ego trip that people have. Um, and, yeah, like, it, it's just, like, a shitty environment, and, like, at all scales of the thing, like, people seem to just, like, really take a shit on the visual artist's head and just, like, expect them to, like, fucking eat it and say thank you. Um, and what I'm talking about is that, like, like, <clears throat> usually don't get credited. You don't get on the flyer. You're not in any of the promotions, even if they're using your videos for the promotions. You don't get mentioned at all. Or if you do get mentioned, it's a tiny... It's like, here's the five bands that are playing, and then here's the visual artist who's doing it. Uh, 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 that's bullshit. You shouldn't, like, put up with being treated like that. Um, shouldn't put up with, like, being, like, put in a shitty, weird location where someone's gonna put drinks on your table all the time. Um, like, where they just kind of, like, shove you off to the side. They don't have a specific area or just, like, cram you into a weird, tiny, like, broom closet next to the projector. Like, they should actually put you somewhere where you're not in the middle of the fucking crowd um, and you don't have to, like, fight to make sure, like, someone doesn't sit down on your table uh, if you, like, get up for a moment. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, yeah, I remember there was, like, one show I was at. I was helping someone, and, like, the musician they were doing, at the end of the musician's set, when they were doing um, visuals, they did visuals the whole night. There's just one musician who, like, at the end of their set... It was very pointed. They made a point of, of thanking the pro show promoter. They thanked the other bands. They thanked the, the, the bar and the bar staff. They, they thanked the sound person. And it was just like, and they didn't even mention the visuals. And it's just kind of like, fucking seriously? Like, are you going to thank the sanitation workers, too? Are you going to thank, like, the fucking city, like, um, the, 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 the city water employees? Um and, like, not thank the person who just, like, did visuals for your set, like, the fuck is wrong with you, yo? Um, <laughs> but it's, like, this whole, like, this weird atmosphere of just, like, you're just there, like, you're probably just, like, fucking pressing play on Winamp, you know? Like, what the fuck are you doing? It's not work. Like, like, you don't deserve recognition. You don't deserve credit. Like, that's all bullshit. Like, people shouldn't, like, fucking take that or be treated like that. <clears throat> uh you usually don't get paid reasonably like if you're doing just think about this so you got like five musical acts and you're expected to do visuals for every single musical act um i feel like you should at least be getting you should definitely getting, be getting paid more than one of the musical acts i don't necessarily think that you should be i mean great it would be great if you got paid just like an hourly rate that was fixed based on how long you had to be there. 
Um, that would make the most sense. Uh, I think just a proportional, like a significant more proportion than just like what people usually get paid, which is everything that's left over off the money, whatever's left over off the money that the musicians, whatever the, the headlining musician demands and then gets like shunted down into the rest of them. Like usually the visual artist is the last person. And if you just don't have any money left by the time it comes to visuals, like, well, at least you got to come out and do the thing because that's what you really want to do. Like, people really leverage that whole, like, you're just doing what you love, uh, so you really shouldn't get paid that well. Like, you're doing things that you're passionate about means that we should be able to take advantage of your passion in order to promote our bullshit, uh, which I think is totally, like, that's, like, a weird, shitty way to spin, like having like a passion or a creative interest in your life that you're also trying to like at least turn into like a part-time job like that whole thing it's like it's not just in like that it's like everywhere in like american society where it's like oh you're getting you're doing something that like is actually makes a difference you're doing something creative you're doing something that you like you shouldn't get paid very well it happens kind of everywhere it's like we think teachers shouldn't get paid very well we think uh, healthcare employees, like most healthcare employees get paid for shit because they're helping people, you know, like you can't really pay them that much. Um, so it's just this huge devaluing of like getting paid decently to do something just because you also like what you do. Like you should get, and then we have this weird thing where you think, oh, you should get paid more to do shit that you hate. You know, this job that you have at like the bank or Google or fucking sanitation worker, you definitely should get paid more than that because that's a shitty job, right? <clears throat> it's totally ass backwards, doesn't make any sense, and like you should definitely be getting paid more than any one of the bands if you're doing visuals for the entire night because you're there working, doing like trying to usually oftentimes trying to make like things look slightly different for every single band so based upon what their request is and based upon they have different musical styles and shit like you're doing more work than any one of the bands hands down guaranteed unless you are just playing pressing play on like win out and which case like fucking more power to you go at it but don't tell anyone and pretend that you're doing more work than any one of the bands um so yeah, you should get paid more reasonably, you should get better credits, and you should not have to, like, have your rig in the middle of the fucking audience. You should, like, why not? You could be on the stage, too. Like, you are a performing artist. Uh, 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 why not just put you on the fucking stage? <laughs> and there's, like, whenever I talk about this, there's always, in, in some kind of a public forum or with, like, a large group of people, there's always, like, one person who, like, kind of, like, says, like, hey, wait a minute. It is worth it just to, like, do whatever for the party. It's usually someone who's, like, a little bit older and has been, like, sort of, like, gigging out for a long time and doing the visuals is, like, the one of their main sources of income. And they've just been, like, treated like shit for so long that they've internalized that as, like, this is just a part of life. This is how it is. And you've just got to be a fucking man. Deal with it and suck it up. It's like, it's like being on war. It's like being at war or something or, like uh some sort of like ordeal that makes you stronger and it's just like it doesn't really make you stronger um it doesn't actually make you stronger to have people like treat you like shit and for you to eat it all the time it actually makes you probably more of a kind of fucked up person if you are in a situation where you're just like submitting to the disrespect of other people on a regular basis in order to do something that you love uh, I don't believe that makes you stronger. I believe that makes you weaker in a number of ways and uh, is severely detrimental to your mental and physical health. What do I know? I don't know. <laughs> I know that I've gone out of my way to make sure I don't have to be in situations where I'm like eating shit from assholes regularly just in order to do stuff that I love and make a living at it. Um, so I think I might know kind of a lot about that. <laughs> Uh, but there's always someone who's going to be like, yeah, I mean, it's just like, you know, you just fucking suck it up and do it because like, this is how, this is how things go. Just deal with it as life. And it's just like, well, no, actually like we're all 
individual human beings, all the people putting on these shows, booking these shows for you are individual human beings. We can all talk to one another and explain like the different places we're coming from and point out that nothing has to be this way and you can always make things change. Um, if you don't fully, like, like then there's some people who kind of agree with me halfway uh, and then they're kind of like, but like the main thing they say is that well, I can't say anything about it because I'm not going to get any more shows. Like, if I am the one who says, hey, can you just put my name on the flyer larger? They're just going to be like, who's this fucking ego tripping, like, uh, liquid light show, like, like, diva? Kick him to the curb. Let's get the other liquid light show person in, like, fucking Indianapolis to do the, 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 the psych fest here. Um, yeah, I mean, like, yes and no. To that like yes if all you care about is yourself and you getting shows then yeah you should do that and you should admit to yourself that all you care about is yourself and you getting shows but on the other hand you're kind of being a scab uh, 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 by sort of like taking if you're eating shit from someone else and helping make sure a job uh, the, that the standards for a job are incredibly low there is a terminology for this in like um, <laughs> for workers it's called you're being a scab uh, it's called you're making things worse for everyone. Uh, 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 so just like that's that's kind of the main thing I think about now whenever like someone's like, well, I don't want to do that. Like I, I, I got to make sure I protect myself and my fucking uh, what do you call it? Um, my career here is that like if everyone just tries to protect their own career and doesn't think about like how other people, how it's going to affect other people, then yeah, we're going to have a shitty system. That's kind of what we have in the United States right now is hundreds of thousands of millions, probably just millions of people. I think not hundreds of thousands of millions, millions of people who all sort of like have that little voice in the back of their head that says, I can't do anything about it. I can't do anything about this shitty situation because I don't want to fuck up my precarious position within this shitty situation uh, 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 and at a certain point you are a part of the problem if that's what you're thinking <laughs> if that's if that's the, the the thought process you're using because your situation is only going to get more precarious if you're on your own um, and that's like in a very small way let's go back to video artists and say you know what most of us who are performing video artists there's not that many of us around in a specific scene and if you actually want to get treated well and treated differently you should get together with all the other performing video artists and vjs around your area and form a fucking union and say these are the demands pay us a little bit better uh give us like a comfortable split space to like do our stuff at preferably on the stage and um fucking put us on the flyer like we're uh like an equal of uh, an equal artist to everyone else because it is actually really important now to have like visuals at like a ton of shows it's sort of de rigueur in certain places if you don't have visual stuff happening people think you're kind of like your shows are uh not really like up to snuff especially if you've got shows where it's just like mostly people like doing like very minimal knob twiddling or like laptop sitting around and poking at like <clears throat> there's not really that's not an interesting performer to see uh and for me that was like a big part about why i was like i need visuals for my stuff now because i was doing slightly more electronic stuff and i was just like this is gonna be really boring like i can't really fucking expect people to like get like uh all like wigged out to like my live shows if like all i'm doing is like if most of the set is me like moving knobs around like there's only so much like little bobbing you can do that's going to get people into it because i was coming from a place where like i used to play in bands and i was like usually like the front person like the the, the lead singer and like front person for bands so i would do like tons of like crowd banter which is pretty much how i like polished this whole like youtube youtuber persona by the time i first started making youtube videos i had like at least like 15 years 15 20 years of experience like doing like crowd work for like like uh <laughs> for bands so it's basically the same kind of thing talking to groups of people is all the same kind of thing um it's it's fundamentally different from talking to an individual person um but it's 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 its own thing but it's 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 same thing from like being a lead lead person in a band to like doing this kind of stuff it, it, it flows quite easily 
Um, but I would, you know, like the, the, with a band where you have like a bunch of musicians and everybody's doing stuff, you move around, you have like some sort of physicality that's like something to like put your eyes on. And like, I noticed this like huge, just like drain in the energy when you go from, you have a full band, everybody's playing instruments and you're doing something together to like, like, that's just not visually interesting, which is one of the main reasons I was just like, I have to do live visuals that I'm performing because otherwise I need to like take some <laughs> attention away from how fucking physically boring I am now. Um, but yeah, like uh, that's that's like a huge number of live performers now is just someone going like. So you need to have visuals or something to mask the fact that it's just like so visually like empty. It's nothing. It's visually nothing to see like someone with a fucking laptop. Just like, that might be like one too many times for me to do that joke, but it's like really fun and easy for me to do. Because <laughs> it's like a joke I've been making for like 12 years now at least. Um, <laughs> at my own expense and at the expense of many others. But yeah, um, all y'all's VJs shouldn't really put up with that bullshit anymore. And like get organized with other VJs. Um, and if because cause even if it's not for you, like, it's for the, there are people who make a fucking living off of this, so don't fucking scab out their fucking jobs, yo. Um, and yeah, also, if you, like, have another kind of job in the world, any other kind of job in the world, and you're getting treated like shit, uh, you should also start a fucking union, whether or not it's legal to, because, like literally how else like like you're not gonna like v there's no one you can vote for that's gonna make your fucking job better like like there's no like uh, a referendum or like candidate that's ever gonna like fix the the situation that's at like your shit job wherever you're at and most of our jobs are kind of shit let's be real here um but if you <laughs> if you get together with all of your co-employees and like figure out like a reasonable Figure out, like, what's your best case series of demands and then come up with, like, a probably, like, a reasonable, like, compromise that you'd make to get started. You might actually be able to get somewhere with that shit. Um, yeah, so that is, you know, the first part of my thing talking about uh, touring and performing and uh, gigging as a VJ. So the next part of this is going to be about gonna go the second part of this prompt was highlights on analog and digital video art history and or influential figures in the craft world would all be cool topics to see covered so that's the second part here um, I also want to give a plug out the other video thing I'll be doing on a semi-regular basis which uh, you don't actually have to pay me for is my AMAs that I'll be doing um, monthly at least until May um, I'll try to keep doing those monthly uh for as long as i can uh, i'll probably have to take breaks at some point for like events and touring um but uh those you can ask me questions live uh you can submit them in advance that's part of my work with the online educational co-op polyphase portal xyz uh, where i also teach classes and a lot of my friends teach really cool classes too so you should check out polyphase portal x dot xyz for more information on that, uh, future classes I have, um, and talks that I'll be doing through there. Um, so that's some pretty cool stuff. Um, so there's one on the subject of like digital video art pioneers in specific, because I'm, yeah, I'm always a little bit more interested in like the digital sides of things. I think the analog world has been really kind of like covered and like hammered down. There's not a lot of like, secret analog video artists out there um i mean they're all pretty obscure but like within the realm of that sort of like obscurity most everyone i think is kind of like known about at this point except for like everyone who did like studio work for like bbc or like broadcast stations in the u.s those people are all kind of like pretty much secret and i don't know that there's a great way to get information on like the analog video art techniques that people used for like television stuff um definitely let me know shoot me an email if you know any resources on this because uh, i'd love to find out more about people who did like special effects stuff 
for like Doctor Who and like old sci-fi movies and stuff like that using like video feedback and weird home-built like video processors and shit like that I think that's the one kind of like really unexplored realm you know the the, the big the big histories all kind of cover like the the you know, like live visual folks on the west coast and east coast and the video art scene that was kind of centered around the sukas in the kitchen in uh new york in the 70s and then experimental television center in upstate new york in the 80s um but there's like one person who i think is really really important who like uh affected like a very significant part of how like not just video artists but like people in the world think about visuals for like live visuals as like a musical accompaniment uh and that is the video game designer jeff minter um some of you might know minter through so they've been a video game designer for like jesus i think like early 80s uh maybe even late 70s at the earliest um they have their own company called Llamasoft. Uh, they got started designing games for like the Sinclair. They're British. So the Sinclair first and then the Commodore 64. And then like been designing video games for just about every, not like the big ones like Nintendo or like Sega or anything, but they designed for a lot of PC stuff uh, when games and Atari. They did a lot of work for Atari. They still do, I think, for whatever... I think they have a pretty contentious history with, like, the current sort of, like, patent trolls who, like, own the name Atari, uh, but they still pay them to do things sometimes. <laughs> uh, they've designed games for Atari ST, for the Amiga, they've designed games for PlayStation 4 now, um, they've got uh, just about every game they have on Steam right now is pretty fucking sick, um... They did briefly design some games for, like, iPhone, which were kind of amazing in terms of, like, uh, iPhone games. It's literally the reason I bought an iPhone 4 way back when, when that, that was the era of iPhones. It was just like, oh, there's Llamasoft games here. I, gotta, I should really check one out. It was great. I, I even kept the iPhone, and I had it uh, fully working only just to play, like, a couple of Llamasoft games games until like one year ago when I like had decided to get rid of like all my shit I'd been kind of hanging on to um so and and they've been mostly kind of independent ish uh, uh for a lot of the, the period they weren't really like a part of any giant games corporations they did do work for like larger games companies here and there but uh, it seems like their general like approach and tactics didn't ever really like mesh that well with large scale games develop developers. Uh, so they've always been more of a sort of iconoclastic like uh, a side project uh, at best in in terms of like how how people view their like their like development and their world and stuff. Uh, but the interesting thing about Jeff Minter is that like. Um, they're kind of the one person you can point to and say, like, they sort of really started music visualizers as we think of them now. So, of course, like, the first music visualizer thing was, like, that Atari um, hardware thing from the 70s that, like, people kind of, like, uh, uh, get very covetous of in the, the, the video art world. Um, I mean, long story short, Angry Plaid, it's like you put... It, it, it has sort of, like, some, like very rudimentary video oscillators in it and you plug music into it and it bounces around to the volume of the video, the, 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 the volume of the audio. Um, it's a very minimal thing. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of a nice enclosure and build out. Um, I think there's some probably some fairly ingenious like designs going on under the hood in there, but it's as far as like a performable instrument, it's pretty minimal. Uh, it doesn't really do that much amazing. Uh, it's kind of like just mostly interesting in that it was sort of like a video synthesizer almost that was designed for consumer use. Um, kind of the first and pretty much like the only video synthesizer that was really designed for like home commercial use and that's sort of like I'm going to buy this and set this up in my home media center or probably not my home media be like in your basement with like the fake wood wallpaper on and like a brown couch 
with like uh, a brown, yellow, and orange like uh, polyester afghan on it. Uh, that's kind of the setting I see it in. Um, probably mostly just ended up next to like exercise bikes and like fondue pots and people's garages uh, uh, was, was probably their ultimate destination, most of them. Jesus Christ, I just fucking poured tea all over myself. Uh, <laughs> I'm on a roll here. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. These things are a lot of work. <laughs> I'm, like, exhausted already from, like, talking so much. Uh, but, yeah, cool video games they made. Grin Ru Grid Runner, I think, is, like, one of their most iconic ones. Polybius is, like, one of their newer ones, which is really amazing. Polybius, um, which is a game which... It's kind of fascinating because, like, I've played it. It's, I think, the only video game I ever actually played with, like, the VR headset on um, that didn't make me want to throw up, which is kind of insane if you look at, like, a playthrough of the game because it's very, like, it's, it's sort of like a fast, you're on a spaceship moving fast through things. You have to move around a lot of stuff and, like, shoot very, like, coarse voxeled enemies, like, all over the place. And there's crazy sound effects, and it's very psychedelic. Uh, it's very distracting. So it seems like the kind of thing that would like make you want to barf immediately in VR. But I think it was designed entirely around VR. And I think part of the thing about Jeff Minter is that we're going to get into more is that they really, really understand how like visuals work, like like how sort of like psychedelic visuals in specific work, and and like how your brain kind of responds to it. And they're able to do this very sort of insane stuff that doesn't make you like it, it doesn't really feel like harmful to you in the way that a lot of like uh, sort of like rave inspired visuals are very sort of like strobing and like sudden cuts and just like sensory overload kind of things in a way that sort of are just like make me at the very least feel kind of like unsettled and unpleasant. And they're sort of in that same realm of like psychedelic rave visuals um, that are very sort of like overstimulating, but they're just like, there's just something about it. There's some like little ineffable like touch about their visuals that like um, makes it like very sort of like engaging in a way that a lot of distracting digital like rave style visuals are like more just like. We're going to overstimulate you to the point where, like, your nipples are going to bleed and, like, your ears are going to fall off and, like, your eyes are going to turn inside out. Like, that sort of a thing. So it's crazy. They, they, they designed this game, I think, around you should be using VR for it. And it's one of, like, the smoothest and most interesting games to play in VR. Speaking as someone who barely plays anything in VR and finds that most of it just makes them, like, mildly nauseous and have, like, a, a migraine. <laughs> um, but the thing about Jeff Minter is probably none of you know who the fuck I'm talking about or any know anything about any of these games I'm mentioning, but everyone has probably experienced, like, their, their, not everyone, but almost most people have probably, like, at least have secondhand knowledge of, like, their contribution to the world of music visualizers. So they, um, and there are other people who have made music visualizers. The other two sort of big ones I can think of would be uh, Kathuga, um, and that was a 90s one for PC, and then Milk Drop, which was also a 90s one, or 2000s one, um, PC-based um, visualizers. Uh, but Minter got started back in the 80s. So their first sort of music visualizer uh, was, I think, for the, the, the Spectrum. Um, I'm going to pull up some videos here to look at their stuff. Um, I, I pulled all of these videos off of, like, other YouTube channels. I'm going to link to them in the description here. Uh, I'm hoping that this doesn't get flagged. I'm pretty sure this is fair use, but I don't fucking know how, like, YouTube's whole algorithm thing works these days. So <clears throat> if this video disappears at some point, I'll just put it on PeerTube or something. Uh, hopefully I don't have to like edit these video things out, but let's look at their first music visualizer. I think this is from, it's called Psychedelia. It's 1983 and let's pop this up in the corner here. So pretty, it's pretty minimal. This was very low bit resolution for the time. Uh, 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 uh. The interesting thing about all of Jeff Minter's music visualizers too, is that 
you have physical controls for them too. So they were built, they were a game designer and they built their visualizers kind of like based around, you're gonna use a game controller and you're gonna be kind of controlling a large aspect of these visualizers. So it's pretty hard to actually see like what is really going on here in terms of like, what are you like controlling? How are you controlling it? I'm sure it made a lot more sense when you're like uh, 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 physically able to do it. But with these older ones, it's kind of hard to see what's going on. There's probably some kind of um, a, a, a seed that you're using, some kind of graphical seed, and then there's something that's playing off of that seed to generate more patterns. Um, I'm gonna draw, so this is a quote from, they, they write a lot. They, they, they have a book, which I think may or may not be coming out at some point about their history of like game development and visualizers development. Uh, but they have a lot of stuff on their blog, the Llamasoft blog that you can read. This is from the blog, and this is about their uh, description of like something that kind of like clicked in their head when they were designing this visualizer. They said, uh, uh, and they figured out some sort of weird little trick with which, which they don't explicitly tell you what this trick is. Um, but they say, here's the quote: "It just felt wonderfully new and somehow primal." It was like the patterns and the mandalas that have fascinated humans for millennia, but come to life under your control. In fact, I was so moved by what I'd found that at first I refused to make it commercial. I felt that something so basic and lovely deserved more than just being another thing to be sold and profited from. So it seems like there's something going on under the hood that's kind of really special with this. And it's just, I think it's a little bit of the aspect of being able to control it, being like you're controlling things. And there's something else going on, which I think we're going to discover because we'll watch more videos of sort of how their visualizers um, advanced over the years. Um, something to note is they did end up selling Psychedelia as sort of a video game uh, starting out. Um, and it was very poorly reviewed. Most people said it was complete fucking ripoff. Uh, they didn't understand why, uh, 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 I think, what was the thing people said? Pointless hippie nonsense uh, 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 was one of the things. But let's just think about that for a second as we start to go and watch the evolution of their visualizers, uh, 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 where they said that there was something really interesting that kind of clicked and happened in their development, and it was like primal mandalas under, under your control. Let's just keep that in mind as we see their, res their, their visualizers become higher and higher resolution. Um, and then the other thing to think about too is that for these early ones, um, their early visualizers were meant for you to just play around music on your hi-fi system. So you didn't put music into the machine, the video game machine at all. It was just like, this is for you to like have some friends over, fucking smoke a dube, cheap the reef. And then you'd like play around with like the light stuff and everyone would be like, wow, that's really cool. Um, so it was about you performing the visuals, which I think is a really interesting thing. And it's really different from how Melt Drop and Cthulhu worked, where they were just kind of like, we're just going to do shit and you're going to have fun watching it. So it's a very, uh, it's a very like functional way. And also to, to handle the like generating visuals question. Um, it's pretty much like a video synthesizer as a video game, which I'm always very interested in. Um, and it's, it's sort of like, it's scrappy in a way. Uh, it's scrappy and engaging in a way that like, just like a, a Winamp plugin isn't. Because a Winamp plugin just like does what it does, doesn't care what you're doing, and it's just going to do cool things uh, on its own without any input from you. So that was the first one. They kept working on these things all the way up until like the early 2000s too. So we're gonna see like the evolution over the 80s, 90s until like they sort of like came to like the ultimate point of where they would be with visualizers. So here's their second one. This was called Color Space. This is also from Color my Space is an early odd one. 80s. It's a light synthesizer uh, for the really BBC Micro, cool, and it's one like of the few games screen. that you can't really describe <laughs> in words at all. You just oh, yeah. have to you crank up your speakers and play around with a humongous so, number really of totally random control keys. Honestly, just watch it go. Mean, in 1983, video didn't really mean what it means to us now. It meant something different. People said video. They usually meant home video uh, or video recording. Video recorder. Just barely at the time when like, you Why don't you know have, like, this a consumer grade, um, you know, like, 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 like,
home videos. Yeah, video just didn't mean the same thing. You can you see on here, in um, this so video, you can see it's got some higher resolution, not very much higher resolution. Uh, we've got like some symmetry going on. You can see right here in this part, it kind of looks like what's happening is that we've got shapes generated. We've got some, and we're probably controlling the way these shapes move somewhere or the other. Here's the point where you kind of see like, what So that was that strobing inversion part. That is just so, 90 seconds of what, what color I'm space does. With each tap of each key, you alter the effect the applied to the lights. You, you can, can even record and playback certain like sections or drop your own images into the arena. Like oh, and if you were wondering about the llamas, so color space like is written by Jeff Minter of LlamaSoft. You'll have a different experience with it every time you play, and it's a really original and unique piece of software. Which most of us who use video feedback have seen that kind of a lot. So what I think is going on here, and it's a thought that will be like entirely like borne out by like later higher resolution examples, is that Jeff Minter figured out how to do video feedback and how to like just use really minimal graphics that you control to sort of see the video feedback. You can see there it's going, it's still going. Um, it's a little bit easier to see on this one. All right, so that's color space. Also not very successful. Um, yeah, I don't think any of their visualizers that they tried to sell on their own as like a standalone product were like successful just cause like, it's a weird thing to market, you know? Um, they probably, if they were just pure shareware and they were sort of like on like more sort of universal platforms, if they ended up writing it for DOS or something, I think it probably would have taken off in a different sort of way than how they did. Uh, but the, just the fact that <coughs> they're the only person really sort of writing and distributing and like promoting these kind of things in the eighties and it's being centered around the idea that you're a performer is sort of really important and like uh, formal to like uh, seminal to the whole um, pr uh, uh, digital video synthesis world. So that's color space. The next one they made, and these were all kind of just like build off the same kind of engine, but like advancing a little bit as like the uh, uh, processors get better and better. So here we go. We're on something that's got Windows. So I think this is like Atari ST kind of looks like, or maybe an Amiga. But here's a Tripatron. Let's skip. So we've got a little like paint style menu. And now it's starting to get higher resolution. Let's pull this up a bit. See this a little bit stronger. Let's maybe not make it the full size just in case there's like some weird YouTube shit that goes on. So now we've definitely got hue cycling happening. You can definitely see that there's like shapes being drawn and then trails sort of trailing off from them. So I think this is the point where it's really inarguable that what they're working with is like video feedback and like patterns that you control. So that's pretty astounding. Um, let's see. But it's still, like this one's still pretty minimal. I don't think we're getting like, I don't think this is like the full demo. I think this is just an example of someone like playing around with it, just getting started. And we've got some cool symmetry stuff happening. We've got some sort of like staggered feedback things going on. All right, pretty great stuff. So that's Tripatron. Um, and then I think we're making it almost to the 90s now. Yeah, so we're in the 90s. Um, so this was sort of the 90s for like a lot of like game developers in the 80s was like a real big heyday because the 90s is when like the home console video game system sort of like hit like a weird boom and like you could actually make like a pretty significant amount of money as a game designer for this because like you could make games that had a wider distribution than you would for uh, uh, I mean Commodore 64s were very very popular Commodore Amigas and the Atari ST were very popular but they weren't quite popular in the same way that a Nintendo was popular uh, 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 because like you bought a Nintendo for like kids, for little kids, but also maybe teenagers and the parents would play it too. Um, whereas you wouldn't really buy a Commodore 64 for like, for the main purpose of like entertaining like small children. 
So it uh, the, the 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 '90s home video game console boom sort of changed things for a lot of game developers who had been for a while, been around for a while. And it was just like suddenly like <clears throat> everyone was trying to make just like uh, instead of making like personal computers because the whole personal computer world too in the '90s changed where. Um, PC literally just meant an IBM clone. It didn't mean like an Amiga. An Amiga wasn't a PC, a personal computer anymore. Uh, PC really just meant IBM clone. And this was the point when IBM or IBM clones and Apple just kind of like choked off the rest of the computing world. So a lot of those businesses instead sort of like tried to put money into like doing home game consoles because this was a market that was booming seemed like uh, uh, uh and, it, it, and it really was kind of the same sort of thing you know you know, but you don't even have to pay someone to like develop and maintain an operating system that you interact with it's literally just about auto load the game play the game um so it's sort of like a lot simpler in a bunch of different ways too uh, so then we get into, and then so he started calling, Jeff Minter started calling their like visualizers virtual light machines. Uh, so VLM1 was for the Atari Jaguar. Um, I don't know that anybody really knows what the fucking Atari Jaguar any, is anymore. Um, Atari, and I don't think this was the same company, this was another round of like patent trolls who bought the name Atari most likely in the 90s. Uh, 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 came and like, um, <clears throat> tried to I think this was like round about the uh, I'm gonna make this bigger too round about like Nintendo 64 era give or take maybe like Sega CD era um, but it was looks like it's like 32 bit color or something it's pretty slick um, this is definitely some like video feedback um, you can see it's doing like some like little like waveform like moving around this was also, I think, the first time that you would put in, like, a music CD into your, uh, uh, you'd, you'd plug the music into the, um, the thing, and it would sort of, like, move around to the rhythm in addition to you being able to control things on the controller. Um, so this is the Atari Jaguar Virtual Light Machine 1. So that's pretty sick. Oh, yeah, there's a bunch of different stuff going on in here. Now you can see here, this is 100% video feedback, no questions asked. We've got hue cycling, we've got the, the, the buffers kind of zooming in and out. Um, this is very clearly doing like video feedback all the way. We got rainbows and shit, like this is pretty sick. Uh, here's some pretty good stuff. You can see uh, that they're, they're able to like, now that they have like a bit more like graphics power to work with, you can do some slightly more complex geometry stuff doing these crazy fucking mandalas. Uh, here's some pretty clear trails going on here. Here's some more minimal stuff. Really, really nice, really slick. So that's Virtual Light Machine for Jaguar. Uh, Virtual Light Machine 2 was for something called the Nuon Home Media thing. It was like a DVD player plus that was being sold in the 90s that would do like um, allow you to do like sort of more like you play DVDs but also be able to do stuff like zoom in and like do weird sort of like uh, I don't know like filtering things like video buffer and filtering things on the DVD I don't know it didn't catch on and it was also supposed to be a game system I think Samsung made it or something I don't know or Samsung just like licensed it from like whoever made it I don't know. Never really caught on, but Nuon paid uh, uh, Minter at the time to put their music visualizer in it so that you would also be able to, like, put a music CD into your DVD player and then, like, use the controllers that it came with to, like, control these crazy visuals. And this is 100% video feedback stuff going on here. There's, like, no questions asked. Uh, this is pretty sick. Uh, I like the colors. I like the shapes here. This is pretty banging. Uh, I didn't include any of the music that was on these original videos, but as you might imagine, the music was all pretty dope. Uh, you can probably imagine what the music sounds like just from like how these visuals look. So that's vi Virtual Light Machine 2. Um, and then there was going to be a Virtual Light Machine 3, I think for like GameCube or something that they were working on with, uh, what was that? That video game developer company that made like Fable and a bunch of other shit, that French company. 
uh, but that all kind of like fizzled out. Um, so that got abandoned. But then the thing that really kind of like came through for them was that they designed, and this is probably the one that like most people really had a, an intimate re interaction with. They designed what was I think Virtual Light Machine Four, which they then called Neon uh, 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 for the Xbox 360. So this is the visualizer in the Xbox 360. Like you'd put in a, a CD and then you'd use the controls to go around and you'd select different modes. Uh, 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 so this is kind of, I think, the really like seminal music visualizer for a lot of people. Uh, uh, this one and I think Milk Drop in the Winamp, uh, Milk Drop as a Winamp plugin are the two ones that like, if you say music visualizer to like uh, a lot of Americans, this is what they think of. And you can see that's pretty sick. Um, I remember playing with this a lot. Super fucking rad. Uh, and you never really knew who created it. There wasn't really like, it was It was a bit of a secret. And that was not like purposefully kept secret or anything. It was just like, this was just this magical thing that existed inside of the, the, the game thing. Um, that like a lot of times you didn't find out about it unless you just put it the CD in to play it. And then all of a sudden you're just like, oh shit. Um, but it was just kind of like this whole thing too, like I said in the first half of this, like, um, it's just this whole realm of like, who gives a fuck who makes the visuals? Like, just the visuals are just there. Don't ask the question. We don't need to give credit to the people who are designing the visuals. Um, <laughs> that whole thing where they just like get taken for granted for designing these kind of things. Um, so yeah, that's the, uh, Xbox 360. And that's sort of the, 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 the culmination of their, like, designing pure visualizers. And they probably got, like, a decent, like, contract off of that. Um, I'm really not sure if this is still being used in, like, Xboxes now. I don't really know shit about video game machines anymore or how this stuff works. Um, but, I mean, you can see that this would be pretty easy to just, like, uh, update, just make it higher resolution uh for like different machines um pretty great like code base but as far as i can tell um just from like reading shit on the internet this was sort of the last thing they made that was a visualizer that was like commercially available in some form or the other um which is kind of a shame but it makes sense because like how the fuck do you make money off of something like this really the only way you make money off of it is you just like sell it to be packaged in with another thing and just hope that that thing gets popular and like they you know kind of like the jaguar was a real uh, uh shit the bed um <clears throat> the 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 nuon really kind of shit the bed gamecube i mean i doubt the, the 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 i doubt anyone would have been like that super gamecube is kind of a weird one it didn't really have like the huge appeal of like the wii or the nintendo 64 or super nintendo or uh, the Switch now, where, like, people kind of, like, very, like, specifically identify. GameCube was sort of, like, neither here nor there uh, in terms of, like, game consoles. Um, so I think the fact that they ended up making the thing for the Xbox 360, which was, like, a very huge video game machine, like, very, very, like, in a lot of households and, like, like unimaginable amounts of people, like, got really high and used this at like little at like parties and stuff i think that kind of like really hammers in like this and it's it's like this like subliminal effect of like using video feedback and they're also using as you can see they're like mapping things into like weird physical spaces um you're able to let's see if we can move around here to different parts there's these really cool parts you see in their games where they're kind of like moving like like there's like these weird two-dimensional projections onto three-dimensional objects and you kind of like are like moving in and out of like the hyperbolic representations of different geometries um um it's kind of like and it's like next level stuff that like not that many people really like do and it's probably the, the reason they did do this is because like they had been working on music visualizers uh, uh for like 20 years at this point so they were the one to do it <laughs> they probably had like an imagination like a, a checklist of like things like someday when graphics processing is better like i'll be able to do this crazy shit and we'll add that in there yeah that's what i was talking about where you do that sort of like weird like shifting like perspectives thing 
which uh, I think is like a very sort of like Minturian uh, 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 technique to use with the visualizer. <clears throat> But yeah, they didn't really make, to my knowledge, haven't really developed any kind of visualizers since then. Or if they have, they haven't really told anyone about it. It's just like some secret under the hood stuff they get paid to shut up about. Um, what they have sort of done is, uh, so what they did with this Neon engine and what they've done with like their, their gaming games like Passass, the, the more sort of high resolution non-iPhone games they've worked on, is they just put their visualizers into their video games now and that's sort of what i was saying about like why polybius has some pretty crazy fucking graphics but you can put it on like in vr and not feel like you want to throw up or at least i don't feel like i want to throw up the same way i want to throw up when i'm using vr in almost any other way uh, uh because the visuals are just like really kind of like fine-tuned to that sort of like psychedelic insanity that really just makes sense to our brains in a certain sort of way but is also like uh, very sort of like, uh, 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 I don't know, like, um, it's just on the verge of overstimulating. It's like the exact amount of stimulation you can stand before you're just like, no more. Uh, uh, so they just take their visual engines and like, get like a dope ass soundtrack for their video games and just kind of like put them in there. And if you play Polybius, which I highly recommend you do if you've got a Steam account, it's a pretty fucking sick game. Um, you can kind of see where they sort of went with that. I guess Moose Life has that a little bit too. Moose Life's a totally different kind of game though. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's the main things I wanted to kind of talk about was like Jeff Minter, video feedback pioneer, totally like not someone anyone in the community really talks about, but I think they probably should. Um, I actually, I emailed him once like a couple years ago and I was like, hey, we should talk on my YouTube channel sometime. I want to ask you literally just talk about music visualizers and your development for that and, like, your philosophy and your experiences in that world. And they never responded. Um, maybe it was just, like, an email address they don't check anymore or something. But I don't know. Maybe I made this video now and they'd, uh, uh, and if people want to, like, bug him <laughs> on, on online more... Maybe we can make a, like a little like interview about Jeff Minter video synthesis, video feedback pioneer uh, uh, happen over here. I think that'd be pretty sick. Um, yeah, so I think that's the main things I wanted to cover in this section of the video. Uh, 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 as always, um, if you want to have a part in deciding what goes on with these videos that I produce for YouTube, uh, head over to my Patreon, subscribe to that. Uh, I think I'll go in and add some like really low dollar amounts like soon too so that people can support for like uh, uh, smaller amounts of money at some point. Um, I think you can support for any amount of money that you want really. Uh, 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 but sometimes it makes a difference if you like officially support like a $1 option or something. I don't know. <clears throat> I'll think about it. Probably 250 is what I'd start with. Like I at least want like a bus fare. <laughs> I at least want like one person to be paying a bus fare on a monthly amount. Uh, uh, we'll sort of tie things to bus fares. Let's see how that goes. Um, if you want to be able to vote on and uh, suggest ideas for like my videos, head on over to the Patreon, subscribe. You can vote if you're a paying member and you can suggest things if you've been paying any amount for at least six months. Um, yeah, and you know, I'll be really interested I would be really interested to see what people write in the comments, but like I have said multiple times, I don't read the comments on YouTube anymore. The comments are really just for y'all to talk to each other. Uh, 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 just remember if you're writing a comment and you want, it's actually something you want me to read and address, I'm never going to read it. Just send me an email. Um, you know, everyone knows my email address. It's uh, dildobongans at um, aol.net um, dot com dot org. Uh, no, you can find my email address on my website everywhere. It's on the front page of my website. It's all over the place. There was this weird thing where, like, all of a sudden people were finding, like, we're sending... I set up, like, a dummy email address as a relay for, like, the contact form on my website. I literally have no fucking idea how people could get that contact form. I, I, I was, like, actually recently looking all over my website. Where is that contact form? And I just was like, how are all these people finding this contact form? And how are they missing the fact that my email address is directly 
the first thing you should be able to see when you land on my webpage written out. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. Uh, but yeah, send me emails if you actually want me to read them. I will read and respond to every email I get. And I will not read or respond to any other message that comes to me from any other way. So, uh, 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 uh. I guess Patreon, I respond to those messages, but not quite as often as emails. Um, so yeah, that's this month's Patreon video. Um, excited to see what people vote for next month. I hope it's something as freeform, or not, not as freeform, but something as like uh, uh, open-ended enough for me to like figure out cool stuff to do with, but also has like a pretty clear suggestion for as well. Uh, all right, uh, as usual, uh, 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 I guess have fun and see you next month.